Hi, everybody. Uh, we're actually starting a new series now. My name is Anthony. I am a developer relation. I do developer relations at Daml, and today I'm going to be taking you through one of our online interactive tutorials. Uh, that's at daml.com/learn. You can see we actually have quite a lot of tutorials. So in this series, I'm going to be working through them one by one. It'll be similar to the other series where I went through the demo cheat sheet, except this is a little more in depth. And of course, you know, if you don't want to watch the videos and want to try these out yourself, just go to demo.com slash learn and you can start them up. Uh, each and every one of these scenarios gives you a complete demo platform, essentially the entire demo ecosystem inside of your browser so that you don't need to download anything. You don't need to install anything. Everything just runs and works. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do data types and imports. So we're going to learn about how functions work in demo records, sums, and how to import other packages and all these very basic things with demo. So this scenario says that it'll take about 30 minutes. I feel like this video is going to be a little less. It'll probably be about 15 to 20 minutes. So let's get started. All right. First, we got to fire up our IDE because we're going to be doing a lot of things in that. Um, but yeah, one of the first things we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at essentially how we declare a type in demo and kind of uh, then how do we assign a value to it? So right here we have our first type, uh, our, our first variable, and that is answer. And it is of type integer. And then we can assign a value to it and we can say answer is equal to 42. Uh, this is basically, since this is demo and it's a a functional language, and I, I'm not using the term, I didn't use the terminology fully correctly, but this is actually a constant function, which basically means that answer is always going to return 42 from now on. And that's a very basic, basic type, but we can have much more interesting types and functions. So what we're going to define here is square, and square is a function that takes an integer and gives you back another integer. And you can actually see that in the type definition here. You have your first integer and then an arrow and it'll point to the second integer. So that's basically saying that the chain starts over here and the chain ends over here. And what you can basically infer from that is that you will take in a number and give out a number because whatever at, is at the end of this. So if, for example, if there were three of them, which this won't type check now, but if there were three of them, whatever's at the end is what's going to be returned and the others are going to be arguments going into this function. So for example, to make that actually work, we could do, you know, squares X times Y, which of course it isn't. So that would be something like, like multiply and then we have, have a function now that takes two integers and does something and returns an integer. And as we're going to see, it's actually very powerful to, uh, these function definitions are very powerful because you can actually know quite a lot about the function itself without reading what it does. Like you obviously still have to read what it does, but you don't have to read what it does all the time in order to kind of get an idea of what it is. And also, I'll show you later, you can even take that idea and say, I need a function that does this. Like, I know what this, I'm not going, I don't want to write this function, but I know that this function will take an integer and it'll take some text and it'll output some other text or something to that effect. And you can actually, knowing what you want your function to look like, you can actually then go and look up your function uh, in something called Hoogle that we use at Daml, which is a pre based on uh, Haskell's Hoogle search engine where you can basically say, I have a function that, or I want a function and I want it to be, do this thing. I want it to take these arguments and give back this argument. And then you can go and look that up. 
which is really, really cool when you're, when you're trying to find out what the thing you want to do is called without having to go and, and regularly Google it. But anyway, we can have you know, more advanced functions yet again, like I demonstrated before with the multiply example where I turn square into multiply. Here we have a function that can do di diagonals. And this one, you know, it'll take a, two decimals and it'll output another decimal. And yeah, so that's really cool. So knowing all that we know now, especially knowing what we know about function definitions, how can we answer this question? And the question says, you know, which of the following uh, is the type of a function that returns the number of occurrences of a given character in a given string? Okay, so looking at this question, we want the number of occurrences of a given character in a given string. So we know we want our function to contain three things. We want our function to return a number, which would probably be an integer, <clears throat> since characters can occur half of a time or any, any fraction of a time like that. Uh, we also know that we want it to be a string to figure out what character, how many of those characters are in a string and it's returning the integer. Okay, so we have then essentially just one option here where we have a character and a string that we're going to give into it and it's gonna give us back an integer. That sounds a lot like what we would want. And I'm not actually sure if this one's in Google, but let's go find out. So just to demonstrate here, go to google.daml.com and we say, oh, we, okay, so that one doesn't exist. So there is no function presently in demo that will do that for us. But if we wanted to work on an into an int, we could look that up and find them. And I'll probably find a better example as we go through this, but that's just kind of what you can do is you can go and take these types that you know about and say, oh, hey, I want to take an integer and I want to output it as text. How can I do that? And then, oh, I have this where I can take lots of things and I'll put them as text. Maybe that'll work. And let me go back here. Okay, so now we've, we've done that. And now we also want to actually use diagonal and try it out. There are several ways we could do this because we need to answer this question of diagonal, what's a diagonal of three, four, uh, we have several ways we could, you know, go ahead and use the Daml REPL. We could use Daml script, which is uh, the way you're recommended to start doing things with Daml when you want to do operations on a ledger and 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 do tests and set up and tear down. Um, but right now, I'm just going to use scenarios, which is the previous version. Um, I don't believe our Catacoda version yet has script in it, but by the time you're watching this video it probably will have scripts, which is actually very similar. It's just uh, a bit different and a bit, bit more powerful and a bit more consistent. But anyway, let me go ahead and uh, write out our scenario. So we write out scenarios by saying scenario do, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our diagonal and we're gonna say diagonal 3.0, 4.0. Turn it. Okay. And then we can actually run our scenario in our in our browser here. And this is actually, you know, it's starting up a demo sandbox. It's actually processing everything and then it's returning the values. And so we could see right here, we've got our return value of 4.999. Uh, pretty sure that rounds up to five. So let's select five and continue. Hooray, we got, we got the answers correct. So then moving on, you know, we have lots of other interesting types too that we can use in DAML that are also fairly similar to what you would find in Haskell. And one of the most basics is a record type. So what a record type does is it allows you to take a variety of different data and put it together so that it forms a cohesive hull. So rather than saying, you know, having street of type text 
and then city of type text. Like these two things, we know that they go together. So if they go together, we can just make a record type. And here we have this record type that stores an address and it stores a street, city, and country. And then we also have a very interesting and useful addition here that if you use Haskell, you'd also be aware of, is we can derive a lot of things here so that these record types can be used in other ways with other functions just as a given. So uh, we can basically say, you know, deriving equality and show. And so what this basically does is it makes it so that we can now test for equality across our record types. So we can see if two addresses match each other. Um, and we can also show them, which means we can make a text representation of all of them. Uh, since DAML is based on Haskell, it has this very powerful type system where it essentially can go and say, okay, I know how to print text uh, on a screen and I know how to convert an integer to text. I know how to convert a decimal to text. Okay, I can just show those without you having to write code to say this is how you do it. And it's also important in within demo for record types to have uh, a quality and show on them because then that means you can use them in most other parts of demo, particularly when we're writing templates, as I'll show you later, uh, we need to have those those uh, those type classes on on these record types in order to make sure that 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 the template can actually handle them uh, because if we remove them then it wouldn't but just really really uh, specific stuff just know that whenever you want to actually use a record type in Daml you should be deriving EQ and show. And so here we have another record showing that records can actually be nested. Here we have a person that can have a name and an address, and that address obviously corresponds to this record type, so they can contain that. And then we, within that person, you know, we can store all these records, and then their address is also a record within their record. Uh, again, you know, if we wanted, we can go ahead and we can say deriving. EQ and show, and since we Daml knows how to print and test for equality on, say, an integer and also an address as a result of deriving them over here, it can go ahead and just derive that again for itself. And so if we were to create a record, we would go ahead and do something like this, where we would essentially say, okay, here's our person, that's their address, the city, country, age, and so on. Uh, you know, very basic, but this is just the syntax you would use. It looks quite similar to JSON. And then once we've actually gone ahead and done this, we have several different ways that we can pattern match and access different parts of the, of the record. So for example, here we have a function that pretty prints somebody's address. And the way they can do it is by using positional arguments because we know street occurs first, city occurs second, and country occurs third. We can say we're working on address types and we're taking things out of these positions and then printing them. The problem with that particular approach is that if you have something where say city <clears throat> is first, now it's going to, and the types still match. Uh, now we're going to end up in a situation where city and street are in the wrong order down over here. So that's not good. So there are other ways to do this that I would actually recommend doing over this, this particular approach. But this is definitely one useful way you can do it, uh, especially in, in cases where you're working with something that, things that might not be named like tuples. But the other way that I would recommend doing most of the time, especially for record types, is to go ahead and use the field accessor. So you can say, oh, address.street, address.city. And now when these things are moved, like cities up here, it doesn't affect it. 
So yeah, now we have a few questions. So first and foremost, you know, what would the following return test person dot age, we can kind of look and say it would be seven. And then what will the following return if we were to pretty print the address, uh, we can go ahead and run that really quickly. Equal scenario do. And we'll just run that. And we should turn this. Oh, also, not really part of this lesson, but you'll sometimes see me using these dollar signs. Dollar signs are essentially shorthand for do everything to the right of this first and then do the stuff to the left. Uh, you can think of them as equivalent to using parentheses around around uh, around different parts of, of your functions and does the same exact thing. So we'll run it and get our results. Okay, we can see our return value. Screen is a little small here, so forgive me, but that should be our return value for when we run that function. And it does exactly what we would expect it to do. You know, it goes ahead and it gets, prints the street, separates it, city, separates it by some text, country, perfect. And so basically what we can then do is we can go ahead and uh, use these record types in templates. And what, what it says right here, what my coworker Robin wrote when he was creating this example is that we can essentially think of a template as a record type, but with some other things on it. You know, it has parties and signatories. It tells you who's observing the contract, who can, use it and do what with the contract. And that's, you know, super, super interesting in that uh, we can really just treat these things fairly similarly and we can, we can just kind of, we can really, if you know, if you know record types from Haskell, you can kind of just imagine a template as a record type that is simply going to be a record type that will commit itself and store itself somewhere. So record types themselves, like if you make just data person and you run your program, if you're not saving it anywhere, you're not really committing it anywhere and you're not really setting any rules on it. Uh, what templates are are basically record types that you can easily commit to a ledger or some sort of database and that you can actually set more permissions and rules around, which is very interesting. And yes, yeah, so just to demonstrate too, if we remove the deriving uh, and the e EQ and show, we, oh, sorry, I should remove the whole thing. What we might end up with is, oh, never mind. I removed it from the wrong one. That's why that wasn't working. If we remove deriving, uh, just to demonstrate what I was talking about before, we now see that our our template can no longer use our record type. And so here the type checker is actually very helpful. It'll tell us, oh, you should use a deriving instance because we can't derive an instance for equality on the person contract because address doesn't have equality. And then it'll show you the same thing for show. It'll say, we can't, you know, we don't know how to print this. Um, we don't know how to turn this into text, so can 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 you derive this? And it basically is saying, go ahead and add deriving to it. And then we can go and and test out some things. So oops, let's call this test two, so the name doesn't conflict. And here we're you know we're just going ahead and creating a person contract on our on our ledger. And we can see that they now exist. And now this is very similar to the record type, except rather than just being stored in memory and then later forgotten. And this is actually something that's been committed to a ledger. This ledger in particular, of course, is in memory, but many, many ledgers and databases also will just write to disk. So yeah. Anyway, we answered the quiz correction we answered the quiz questions correctly up above, I believe. So let's move on to the next thing. The, okay, so our next very fun data type 
is enumerations. These are very similar to enumerations that you would find in many other languages. Basically, you have this data that can be one of several different things, and you can go ahead and specify them. So here we've defined gender, and then you know we want to extend our gender function to allow other genders to be specified in a, in a general sense, and then we can go ahead and say, okay, now our options are M, F, and other, and you can provide text for, for that other option. You know, you can also extend these so that you have all, mm, the, all sorts of genders included. Uh, and this is just kind of showing too that, you know, you can have this enumerative type, but your enumerative type also is able to enumerate not just that to that specific type, that MF, but it can actually contain other types within it. So you can even, for example, you could add text to any of these. So you can add qualifiers for all of these and then work on them. Um, I don't think the way these functions are defined here is going to, actually, you know what, we'll leave one, it'll throw some errors, but then we'll show how, how that works. So here we have our type. And then what we can do too is we can go ahead and handle all those cases. So for handling cases of these options, we can go ahead and say, okay, well, what we want to do is we want to is we want to print these things. Uh, so we can say, here's how we're going to handle our cases, and it's going to also make sure we handle all of our cases, or that if we don't, we can have a case where we handle all other cases that we, we weren't interested in. So for example, here, we're getting a bit of an error, uh, and I'll go into that in a second, but we can say, okay, in case of M, we're gonna print male. In case of F, we're gonna pr print female. In case of other, we're going to print O, which is, a, which is that text attached to other. But male also has a text attached to it here. So in order to, in order to deal with that, what we can do is, if we weren't interested in the text, we can say bottom. And what that basically does is that lets us discard uh, that text there because we weren't interested in, in, in printing it. The other way we could do that too is we can, you know, we could assign it as, as a, give it a variable, but we just wouldn't use it. But in general, the, the best way to do it is that. And then for example, if we wanted to, you know, uh, just print if we wanted to just handle any particular case we can do this and we can say you know bottom any of these types we should just print some text and that's it um, so yeah so that's the that's the way you would handle those different cases of having of enumerating these things. Anyway, I need to just reset that so that when we run our functions, we'll get the right thing. Okay, so if we do pretty gender M, we can, it'll go ahead and return mail. And then if we were put hello world as a text, uh, it would return that. So we can go ahead there. So now with our the next thing we can work on is type synonyms. Uh, what this essentially means is that when we're working with these types, we don't always want it to be an integer, for example. So here's a great example is uh, a phone number. When, when we have a phone number, you know, we might represent it as text or an integer or something to that effect, but we don't want to call it just text because it's not just text, it has other meaning to it. And so what we do here is we say, you know, okay, we're taking a phone number and then we're printing some text. And we're basically saying, you know, our we've gone ahead though and said, oh, our phone number is actually a type and the type is actually integer. So integer and phone number are now equivalent to each other. If you have a function that works 
on an integer, I believe it'll work on a full number. Let me just check that really quick. Um, Pretty fun number. Yep, it'll work. So yeah, uh, essentially they, if you have any function that works on an integer, it'll also work on a phone number now because they are the same. We're just using that, that type name as a convenience so that we're much more informative as to what type of data we're really, really working on. So let me just do this here. Okay, and so the other thing we can do too is we can go ahead and uh, change the phone number to actually be a variety of data. And so what we can say is, oh, we want our phone number to be not just an integer because just an integer is not enough data to represent everything. So what we can do here is we can have uh, it be another, it be a data type, it essentially be a record type. And we can do, we can, we can have, you know, the variety of different digit groups. And then we can go ahead and, you know, represent those in much the same way we represented addresses when we were pretty printing them. And so, yeah, you can also go ahead and import your own modules. So what this basically means is that, you know, if you have fairly common functions, much like you would in any other language, you can put them in a module and then go ahead and import them. In this case, you would be able to say, go ahead and import address book. Um, I won't work through this particular part in too much detail. But if you want to try it out yourself, you can go ahead and check out the editor. And you can then go and take your address book, take your data, and put everything that's common into you know, your, your library, and then go ahead and import that. And you also have a variety of ways to import data. So you can import data very specifically. You can say, I want to import things, but I only want to import these things from from address book like i only want to import address i don't want to import person because i'm not using the person representation on things or you can say okay well i want to import dress book but i want to do a qualified import i want to go ahead and import it you know as a so then i can refer to the person and and, and addressing them as a dot person and a dot address uh, instead of just importing them at the higher level it's very useful too when you want to, you know, when you're working with a lot of different libraries, um, qualified imports do come in handy very often in DAML. And so we have a couple more questions here. So which of the following function types will be in scope after the import statement import address book? This is a tricky question too. I actually, I answered this one before it was a little tricky. Uh, the answer is actually most of these things. So the constructor that actually puts together the address will be it, uh, the address type. And so what I mean by that is your constructor is over here, basically says how the address is formed, how it's constructed. Uh, and then your type is over here, basically says, okay, this is, this, this is the address type. And so this is just something to keep in mind is that, you know, when you say a data address equals address, that sounds kind of redundant, but it's there for a reason because one is the type and one is the constructor for that type. And so the other things that are available are street, obviously, city, country, lookup is not available, but length is. And that's why this was a tricky question because length is always available. It's part of the prelude in DAML. Um, if you're coming from a Haskell background, that's the same as the prelude in Haskell. It is the portion of the library that's always imported. So the, for very common functions, 
like length there and there. And then, okay, which of the following function types will be in scope after the import statement import qualified address book as a? Well, a dot address the type should be, a dot street should be, and length should be. Let's see if I've answered those correctly. Yep, I did, yay. Okay, and then, yeah, so the same way you could import your own, your own libraries, your own modules, uh, Demo also lets you import, Demo also comes with a lot of, of very useful modules. So for example, you know, you have da.date. So if you wanted to import da.date, you can go ahead and do it here. And then you could say, okay, uh, we want, oh, not an address. We want to add a birthday to this type person, and then we can say their birthday, we're going to have it be a date. And so once we do that, though, we can actually see that our, some of our other functions broke. Um, in particular, the test person function broke because it's saying, or the, yeah, the definition here, there's no test person. Uh, I mean, there's no birthday on this test person. So what we need to do is we need to find that. Uh, because we can't, when we're defining record types, every part of the record type needs to be defined. You can't have, well, you can actually work, there are ways to specify an optional uh, way to do, to provide something, but you need to use an optional type or a maybe type or something to that effect. But when it comes to other types like date, date is not optional. If we called it optional date, it would be. But since it's not, we need to actually give it a date. So we can say, okay, well, the date can be, you know, say the 20th of September, and we can say 1980. Um, oh, and we need to actually call this, we need to use the function date. And so then, then now type checks, and now we've given this uh, person who is not seven, clearly because their birth date is in the 1980s, um, a birthday. And then, yeah, if we wanted it to be optional, we could say, you know, optional date, and we could work with the way optionals work to actually specify that. But I'm not going to go into that. It's just that when you're normally defining types, everything needs to be defined. So even in the case, if this wasn't optional, you would still have to define it as, you know, there is something here or there isn't something here. And yeah, so that's mostly how you do it. But this one also goes into kind of how you would build a module and then how you would import it. So I guess we could go ahead and do that. Uh, so now we're not really looking at types, we're looking at how we include modules in our files. So we go ahead and we build our DAR file out of, um, out of our code over here in our directory. And so now what we need to do is we need to go ahead and point our daml.yaml file at it. And so that's this line here is going to do that because here we can basically define all our dependencies and I'll show you the daml.yaml file in our IDE. Here it is, our dependencies, it includes prim, it includes stdlib and daml trigger, which is a service for doing actions on demo, essentially responding to events, but that'll be covered in another video. And here we'll just include our DAR file. And then we can actually go ahead and import our address book uh, from the DAR file. So we can go, you know, if we were to go to calendar and we need, decided, hey, we needed to include addresses in our calendar, we can go ahead and import them. And yeah, so that was basically a look at data types and imports there you know, super flexible. They're really cool and interesting things to use. They're fairly similar to, in a lot of cases, to Haskell. So if you're familiar with that, um, that's a great starting point. But if you're not, it's really quite, it's really the same to learn as, as any other language. So I would say that you should definitely try it out. And, you know, if you have questions, we have discuss.daml.com for our forum. We obviously have all these lessons online and easily accessible for you to work through at your leisure. 
and yeah, we're always, you know, happy to answer questions and help out. So yeah, until next time, thank you for watching my presentation on how to use data types and imports.